Uh, hi, thanks for coming. Um, uh, Janus Varoufakis, as you've known, that's why you're here, is with us here tonight. Uh, he is a Greek economist who is now with the University of Texas and who made the name really for comments on the crisis which were different from what we were seeing in mainstream media and we're thankful to whichever editor picked it up first and then it rolled on. Uh, so I don't think I need to say much more about it. Uh, he'll give an hour lecture and then I'll ask one or two brief questions and then we'll uh, open the floor. And Yanis, please. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone, the organizers and especially all of you for being here. I'm going to stand up. Right. I hope I'm not making your life difficult. Um, okay, it all started, as you said, in 2008, when capitalism managed to have its second great spasm after 1929, setting off a chain reaction that uh, put Europe into a never-ending downward spiral, which is now threatening to push Europeans into a vortex of almost permanent cynicism and misanthropy. For the last three, three and a half years, I've been addressing various exceptionally diverse audiences. I have a list here. I've addressed the Syndagma Square indignados, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, uh, green members of parliament in the European Parliament in Brussels, uh, Bloomberg in New York and in London, hedge funds, series activists in Athens and in other cities around Greece, schools in the United States, the House of Commons, the House of Lords, exceptionally diverse audiences. And nevertheless, my point has been quite simple to each one of them. And that is that the crisis that started in 2008 and which is accelerating, not subsiding, is not just a threat for particular groups of people, or social classes for that matter. It's not just a threat for workers, for the dispossessed, for bankers, for particular industries, for particular countries. It constitutes a clear and present danger for civilization as we know it. At least that's my view. And this is the message I've been trying to carry across to these different audiences. Once that message had been registered, my immediate priority was to put forward pragmatic and realistic proposals for how to stabilize the situation, how to stop in its tracks the juggernaut of human suffering that was progressing viciously from one country to another, from one realm to the next. Now, in... March 2012, if I'm correct, if memory serves, there was a blog post by some anonymous, more or less, or not very well-known, radical lefty, who admonished me for being uh, defeatist, for putting forward proposals that, instead of offering to replace capitalism, they were suggesting ways in which capitalism could be saved from itself. Today here in front of you, I want to confess to that. I want to say that he was right. And actually, it hurt quite a bit to read it. And I shall be confessing to a, num a number of other things at the same time. But I, we must always beware of the fact that confessions are pregnant with what John von Neumann, the great mathematician engineer, cold warrior, once said about Oppenheimer, who used to be his boss at the Manhattan Project because von Neumann and Oppenheimer worked together creating the atom bomb. And upon hearing that uh, Oppenheimer had turned nuclear, anti-nuclear campaigner and had expressed the regrets for having contributed to the atom bomb, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the great cold warrior John von Neumann, also known as Dr. Strangelove because of the fabulous movie by Stanley Kubrick, quipped that Oppenheimer was confessing to the sin in order to claim the glory. Now, I promise this is not the kind of confession you'll be hearing from me tonight. Indeed, the kind of confession that I want to present to you constitutes, as far as I'm concerned, a radical strategy. A radical strategy that I see as part of a radical humanist political agenda for maintaining in our sights, in our heads, in our ears, 
a sense of rage towards capitalism. Why lending capitalism a helping hand in this hour of crisis? Because if we stand idly by watching our ruling classes stupidly, idiotically allowing capitalism to collapse at this juncture in history, the only ones who will benefit will be the misanthropes, the racists, and the Nazis. The left is not ready at this stage to take the uh, burden on its shoulders of uh, what will happen as at least European capitalism, and of course global capitalism, is, is collapsing. So, confession as a radical strategy. Now, turning from the political to the personal, just for a second. When I chose my PhD thesis back in 1982, whenever it was in England, I chose a topic and a theme of study that was highly mathematical and in which Marx was irrelevant. Marx's theorizing simply made no sense within that context. When later on, after having received my PhD, I got my lectureships at the University of Essex, East Anglia, Cambridge, and so on, um, there was a, the implicit contract between myself and the departments that hired me was that I would be teaching a kind of economics which left no room for Marx. In the late 1980s, unbeknownst to me, I have to say, I was hired by the University of Sydney Economics Department in an attempt to escape from Thatcher. And what I found out later was that I was hired by the right-wing faction of the economics department who hired me in order to keep a left-winger out. Then in the 2000s, when I returned to my homeland, Greece, I got embroiled, and that is a serious confession, with George Papandreou and the PASOK Socialist Party, in inverted comma, Socialist Party, in a bid, from a personal point of view, to participate to participate, to lend a hand to the attempt to stem the conservative tide that was ushering the right-wing conservative party into government with a clear anti-immigration and racist agenda. Of course, there we failed, and then we had the PASO government destroy our social economy. Uh, more recently, the proposals that I've been banding about and been putting to various audiences that I mentioned before if you read them, there is not even a whiff of Marxism in, the, in those proposals. They are indeed, we call them, a modest proposal. The purpose of which, as I said before, was to stem the disintegration of European capitalism. For reasons which I touched upon very briefly before, but I shall return to in a, in a minute. So, this was just a, a little personal um, exposition of a past that if you, if you look at what my work and my various moves, there's not much Marx in there. And yet, I'm standing here in front of you today with the title, Confessions of an Erratic Marxist. Why am I calling myself a Marxist? If my whole academic career is based on material in, that, that is completely, not at odds with Marx, but ignores Marx utterly and completely. Well, <laughs> Let me say that the way I understand the world was formed by the bearded one from a very early stage of my life. I remember when my father, who was a metallurgist, dealing with metals, chemical engineer, uh, impressed upon me at a very early age that before metal technology was developed, uh, humanity was in the realm of prehistory. And it was only when we moved from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age that history sped up. Its velocity, velocity began to be counted in the centuries as opposed to in the millennia. And it was only much later with mass production of steel that history sped even further up and it was counted in the decades. And much more recently, of course, with silicon and microchips, every time the iPhone is... Uh, updated, history is almost rewritten. And this triumph of human reason over our technological means empowering us over nature 
while at the same time exposing the primitive nature of the relations, the human relations and the social relations between us, that narrative, which I gathered from Marx, was essential in, in helping me understand what on earth is going on on this planet. Um, and that historical materialist perspective on the world was uh, constantly reaffirmed by the most interesting and unexpected of ways. For instance, has anyone watched the episode of Star Trek Voyager called At the Blink of an Eye? If you haven't watched it, and you're Marxists, you should watch it, because in 45 minutes you have a wonderful depiction of historical materialism at work. The Starship Enterprise is caught up in orbit of that of a certain planet, and the peculiarity of that planet is that time moves 50 times faster on the surface of the planet than in orbit. So the people, in the, the, the crew of the Enterprise actually watch history evolve in front of their eyes. And at first, the primitive humanoids who are residing on that planet are looking up and they see that glimmering starship and they think it's a god. By the end of the episode, 45 minutes later, of course, they've developed their own technologies and spaceships and they've gone up there and help Enterprise liberate itself from the orbit of that planet. Now, I started reading Marx because these were, these were revolutionary times in Greece due to the collapse of the the fall of the dictatorship, at the age of about 11, 12. As I said, these were strange times back then. And what caught my eye was Marx's unsurpassable, mesmerizing gift for writing a dramatic script for human history. It's, it was a bit like, not a bit like, precisely like, encountering a get-together between Dr. Faust and Dr. Frankenstein, on the one hand, and Adam Smith and David Ricardo, on the other, creating this narrative populated by figures who were dramatic personae, who were struggling to harness reason and science in the context of empowering humanity, but without, unwittingly, without intending to, unleashing demonic forces that were usurping and subverting their own freedom and humanity. When, he, for instance, I read the, the lines, conjured up machines with gigantic productive powers, but like a sorcerer who has lost control of the power of the netherworld, he has called up by his spells, we have become their slaves, the machine slaves. So this dialectical perspective where everything is pregnant with its opposite and the eager eye that Marx had with which he discerned the potential for change in the most seemingly the most constant and unchanging of social structures that to me was exceptionally fascinating and it made me grasp the great contradictions of the era that we've been living in for the last 300 years think about the industrial revolution think about capitalism it is a production, a metaphorical production line that produces, in the context of joint production, two things simultaneously. Immense wealth and unprecedented poverty. Poverty that humanity never experienced before, even during the feudal era or even slavery. Today, look at our, our Euro crisis or look at the crisis of realization in Marxist terms in the United States of America or in Japan. People, people. The official commentary refers to the debt crisis, but they forget that while we have a mountain of debts and banking losses, we also have a mountain of surpluses, profits, that are idle, utterly terrified of being invested into productive activity in this environment of crisis, and therefore failing to produce these surpluses, the incomes which would be necessary in order to repay the debts and to cancel the banking losses. So this dialectical joint production of good and evil, of wealth and deprivation, of spirituality and depravity, that dramatic script was exceptionally important in shaping my mind. From an economics perspective, as I was imagining myself 
having a future as an economist. I'm talking about now 15, 16, 17. I remember that I considered, and I still consider, Marx's greatest contribution to economics, to political economy. His very simple differentiation between, let's say, electricity generators and human labor. A distinction which didn't exist before Marx in political economy, it didn't exist after. And what is the distinction? Electricity generators are, are commodities, and nothing but commodities in the capitalist order. Human labor is constantly commodified. Capital, employers struggle. They employ their cleverest tactics to commodify labor, and yet they can't. But this is a tragic play, because if they succeed in commodifying labor fully, then suddenly capitalism will die. Think about the invasion of the body snatchers in the 1953 great movie, which was remade very badly again and again after that. Imagine that we have these spores that come from outer space and invade our beings and turn us into empty shells, humanoids that have lost all free will, all creativity, or all subversiveness, and instead go through the motions of going to work, of sleeping, of eating, of producing, of consuming, and so on and so forth. Suddenly, that post-human society will have become nothing significantly different to a mechanical watch. A mechanical watch has parts. They all work together, and they produce a function. An integrated, integrated circuit of a computer does the same thing. You don't hear a watchmaker or a computer scientist talking about the value that is produced by the cogs of the machine. Because there's no need. You can, in engineering terms, you can tell the whole story about how the watch works or the computer works without the notion of value. Indeed, the moment capital succeeds in squeezing that indeterminate human free will from the laborer, as it has, tries to do, it will be, as a system, incapable of producing value. And then, to the extent that it can only survive by the accumulation of value, it will go into recession, it will go into a crisis, and that will unleash some extra degrees of freedom in the humans that it tried to suppress, and the cycle will start all over, all over again. That economic concept of the labor input as radically different to all other inputs, and labor as the only commodity which can never be fully commodified, was to me, and still remains to this day, Marx's greatest contribution to our way of conceptualizing the political economy we live in. So when he was writing that labor is the living, form-giving fire that lends value to commodities, he was not just being poetic. He was being at its highest level of, of economic analysis. And when he talked about capital as a social relation between human beings and a force that we must submit to, he was talking about the effect that particular property relations have when we have non-owner workers and non-working owners coalescing in the context of the labor contract that creates a social dynamic, a historical dynamic, where machines cease to be just pieces of machinery, and they become a force that we must subject to. And when he says we, he doesn't only mean the proletarians, the workers, he means also the employers, who must become part and parcel of the same machinery, losing their own freedom to, terrified that if they don't exploit labor, then they will become exploited labor themselves. That is the... the, 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 the almost ancient Greek Shakespearean tragedy that he's describing in terms of an economic analysis that, in my mind, at least as a young person, made perfect sense before I went to university. Since I have mentioned movies already, let me conclude this part on Marx's great dialectical contribution to our understanding of the economy by saying that, seen from these Marxian eyes of mine, The Matrix, the movie, is not a futuristic science fiction film. It's a documentary of the world we live in. 
Because if you think of this, an impressionistic documentary, but a documentary nevertheless, it describes the world we live in. A world in which the inexorable efforts of capital to commodify labor are creating a society of auto automata where humanity only provides, in the final analysis, the thermal energy that is necessary for the machines to do their job. But to the extent that they are successful in getting rid of free will through the matrix, if you've watched the movie, and I'm sure you have, most of you, that system cannot produce value anymore. And that system can only reproduce itself as a mindless melange of machinery. And in that movie, the band of subversive humans who have escaped from the matrix and tried to liberate the rest of humanity, for me, are symbolic of that hostile element of humanity which remains embedded in human labor and must remain embedded in human labor under capitalism so that capitalism can produce value and accumulate. Moving beyond movies and um, the abstract, let me share with you, not something you don't know, of course, but let me just uh, recapitulate on some of the insights that this particular perspective, Marx's perspective, has bequeathed us and which are essential in our struggle to make sense and uh, uh, sense of the world we live in and to affect it. The first one is, concerns the nature of wealth. We live in a society which is uh, procuring the fallacy that wealth is privately created and then appropriated through tax taxation by the state. When Marx so beautifully explained to us, guided us to the truth of the opposite, that wealth is collectively produced and privately appropriated. Autonomy, in this postmodern world of ours, there is a lot of work uh, discussion about autonomy, both from liberals and post-structuralists. But we keep forgetting that autonomy is collectively produced, uh, and certainly not individually. The social democratic tradition has been caught up now in, for 70 years in a bogus dilemma between equality and liberty that Marx dismissed so beautifully and powerfully. And unfortunately, even the Marxists of the 20th century frequently forgot that Marx's critique of capitalism was not that it produced an inegalitarian society, but that it was producing an irrational society that was restraining the freedom of everyone on both sides of the class divide. When we talk about climate change, as an economist, I live and suffer on a daily basis the inanity of my profession that rush headlong into market solutions for dealing with bads as opposed to goods, with pollutants, with CO2, creating emission trading schemes and trying to address the failures of the market mechanisms of capital accumulation by adding more markets and create artificial ones that we create. Only if you have a Marxist perspective on the creation and formation of markets will you ever understand that an emission trading scheme is firstly bound to fail, and secondly, it adds to the social conventions and the ethos and the morality that is part of the problem with climate change. I will finish off in terms of these gems that we owe to Marx, and which I owe to Marx, by mentioning the democratic deficit, which is one of the major deficits that our societies are facing. But Marx would have simply laughed at the crocodile tears that are being shed over the democratic deficit and the diminution of political democratic goods. He would think that this is a great success of the capitalist system. What was the project of liberalism, of bourgeois liberalism from the 19th century onwards? It was to separate the economic sphere from the political sphere and to confine politics in the political sphere, leaving the economic sphere to capital. And this has been exceptionally successful. 
even in South Africa today, this is precisely why the ANC is finding itself in the, the, the dire straits it's finding itself in, and why in the end, however much we enjoyed seeing Mandela in the presidential palace, there was a precisely that kind of separation. And if you don't believe me, ask me the miners who lost their lives a few months ago. At this point, I'm going to turn to the word erratic that I use in, my, in, in, in the title of my talk. And I shall explain why I'm angry with Marx and why I'm certainly not a Marxist Marxist. In the sense that Marx once said that he was not a Marxist. I believe that Marx made two spectacular mistakes, two errors of omission, if not commission, at least possibly one was omission, the other was commission, from which the left is suffering. And because the left has messed up so spectacularly over the last hundred years, the world is suffering. The first mistake is the most, more mild one, the error of omission. He was insufficiently dialectical, insufficiently reflexive. He never gave any serious thought, and he kept a judicious silence on the impact that his theorizing would have on the world around him. For instance, I'll just give two examples. His theory is exceptionally powerful, for reasons that I tried to sort of summarize. Didn't he understand that his disciples that would be privy to these powerful ideas might use that power that they would gain from his theories in order to disabuse their other comrades, whether they were um, Stalinist prison guards or ministers of the interior in Bulgaria, or indeed tenured professors in some British university who gathered around them a band of impressionable young kids. Another example. We very well know that the success of the Russian Revolution, the emergence of the Soviet Union, caused capitalism to recoil and to tolerate and concede, for instance, the National Health Service in Britain, the social welfare state. He'd never imagined that that would happen, and he'd never prognosticated the effect that the rise of the Soviet Union would have in adapting capitalism in such a way as to divide the working class, both in the East and in the West. But these, as I said, I'm perfectly prepared to forgive. Who is a prophet after all? However, what I'm not prepared to forgive him for is his second error, which I think is an error of commission. The fact that he decided that truth was to be discovered in the equations of his economic models. We ended up after years and years of sterile scholasticism in the economics departments where some Marxists, Marxist economists worked, with what Nietzsche described as the pieces of mechanism that have come to grief. And the reason why that is, is because there can be no truth coming out of mathematical economic models. The reason, we could discuss this later, if you, and I'm sure you will want to ask me questions on this, is that it is... In, theoretically and mathematically impossible, just as it is impossible to square the circle, to combine within the same model, mathematical model, a theory of value and a theory of growth. And if you don't have a theory of value and a theory of growth in the same model, you might as well not have any models. This is the short version of my critique. Marx knew that, and that's why I don't forgive him. But he was so determined to flatten citizen Western have you, has any one of you read Wages, Prices and Profit, which is effectively a transcript of a talk he gave in a trades union context in London, in which he admonished that poor man, trades unionist Western, citizen Western, for having dared to raise a query that if we workers push wages up through strikes, well, perhaps prices will go up and then, you know, we'll lose all the benefits of our struggle. And Marx decided to strike him down by proving beyond reasonable doubt, scientifically, and he called him an unscientific, an anti-scientific git, or words to that effect, that in his model, a boost in wages will never increase prices because prices re reflected labor values. 
When he returned to this question in volumes two and three of Capital, he realized that that wasn't true. He realized that it is impossible to close your model mathematically, like having a system of two equations into an ounce and solving it, while allowing for complexity, for different degrees of capital utilization in one sector compared to the other. And yet, he wanted to steamroll this mathematical economic logic over his disciples in order to argue in a 19th century mechanistic deterministic way that the truth is to be found in those equations, the truth of capitalism. That was effectively the worst own goal in Marx's life. Because if I'm right in what I was saying before, that his greatest contribution was to explain to us so beautifully, poetically, succinctly, and analytically correctly, that it is the indeterminacy of the labor input that makes capitalism a fundamentally unsustainable and contradictory crisis-prone system. That indeterminacy means what? It means you cannot have a labor input in your system of equations that is mathematically determined. So if you insist that the truth will have to come out of your mathematical equations, you are effectively destroying the very indeterminacy that you have elevated to the level of an important economic analytical category. And he knew that he did it, but because he was completely and utterly convinced that the trades unions movement, the workers movement, needed to have a scientific background, a mathematical model that can be solved like me classical mechanics, he pursued with it, even though you can find in footnotes and various patches in volume three that he knows that what he's saying is not completely right. So strange are the rituals of emptiness, but even stranger are the rituals of Marxist economists who for decades have been wasting their lives trying to work out Marxist economic models in juxtaposition to the bourgeois economic models, which are just as irrelevant even they are all economic models are irrelevant regarding the understanding, the grasping of capitalism. This is where I believe it is progressive and very radical to bring an enemy of the left in, in, within our midst, John Maynard Keynes. Because John Maynard Keynes, being a free-spirited bourgeois thinker, and intellectual, in the midst of the recession, the Great Depression, he wanted, he was quite happy to break free of the Marshallian tradition that he was following, the bourgeois neoclassical tradi marginalist tradition that he was following, and to say, folks, none of our dogmas work. Look, wages are collapsing and employment is falling too. It's not increasing. Employers are not hiring more people because wages are going to zero. Interest rates are collapsing and there's the liquidity trap. There's no investment. So something is happening here. And he made a discovery, which was very simple to make. What happens is, in capitalism, you have an indeterminate system with what we call in economics multiple equilibria. Do you know what this means? That anything goes. That we are, as, as my Australian, an Australian student of mine once said, Professor, are you telling me that John Keynes said that we are buggered if we know. I said, yes, this is precisely the, you know, the one insight by John Maynard Keynes. We are buggered if we know. We don't know what capitalism will do tomorrow. It may fall on its face and not get up again. The animal spirits idea of Keynes is a very radical idea. It's the idea that, Ke that Marx first introduced and then crushed because of his commitment to economic models, which Keynes started off from, but then abandoned in order to understand the Great Depression. So we need, we don't need a general theory. It's a horrible book. Don't read it. What we need from Keynes is this idea that capitalism is an indeterminate beast which is perfectly capable of falling down and finding it absolutely unable to pick itself up through market forces. That is a radical idea that Marx should have had in the middle of Das Kapital, but he didn't have, possibly because of 19th century mechanism. Now, let me go back to the personal again, to my own self, because I did mention that I started my academic career selecting very mathematical models, mathematical economics models, traditional, conventional, 
bourgeois mathematical economic models. And this was what I chose to study when I was at university and to write my PhD dissertation on, and then to build a whole career on that. Well, let me at first defend it as a choice, as a strategy. When I was making these decisions, it was the late 70s and early 80s. It was at the time when it was, the writing was on the wall that progressive economics, whether it was Keynesian, Kaletskian, John Robinson at Cambridge, uh, uh, not to mention Marxist, was out. That mathematical economics was a dominant paradigm. And anyone who didn't speak that language would simply not be heard by the might and mighty and high. And I remembered reading in Marx a description of his own method, which he called immanent criticism. What is immanent criticism comprised of? It means you take your enemies' theories, you don't challenge their assumptions, their premises. You say, okay, so this is what you're assuming, let's see what you're assuming. And let's, assume, let's accept what you're, you're assuming and see whether what you think is the conclusion from your assumptions is truly the conclusion from your assumptions. And to challenge their own logic, not their own assumption, because nothing upsets the dominant paradigm more than to say, I shall accept your assumptions, but I shall prove to you that you are failing your own principles. This is what he did with Adam Smith and David Ricardo. He took David Ricardo and Adam Smith, extended the, the, their theory of value to answering the question, so what determines the, the, the wage? And in volume one showed that capitalism is bound to be um, crisis prone, using Adam Smith's and David Ricardo's analysis, not his own. He only tampered with it in a way that Ma Ricardo couldn't resist had he been alive when he was doing it. So I thought I would do the same thing. I would, you see, take financialization, take the neoliberal macroeconomic policies of the 70s, 80s, 90s today. What are they predicated upon? The so-called general equilibrium model. They say, all right, there is somebody in Princeton, at Harvard, you know, Kenneth Arrow or Gerard Debre, very abstract mathematical economics, economists who have created this economic model, and it shows what? That it is possible to have a capitalist market economy which is in equilibrium and therefore efficient. Okay, so in order to bring that economy about, we need to introduce privatization, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So my intention was to employ the strategy of imminent criticism. Say, all right, let's take this general equilibrium model, which, by the way, the macroeconomic policymakers never understood because it was too mathematically complex for them to understand. So I thought I'd make it my business to understand it better than they do in order to argue that their Bible is teaching a different dogma to the one they think that it is teaching. Uh, that was my first mistake. It was a mistake because even though it allowed me to be a professor of economics, simply because the neoclassical economists, the right wing, did not realize that I'm not one of them, because they couldn't even read the mathematics that I was doing, so they gave me jobs thinking that I was one of them. That's why the right wing of the Sydney University Department of Economics employed me. And of course, after a while, they regretted their decision, I'm pleased to say. But that was my first mistake, and I'll tell you why. Because I had this bourgeois view, expectation, that if you presented these Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Celtic professors, colleagues, with a mathematical proof that their model is wrong, that they would care. They don't. They used to. You know, people like Frank Hahn and Kenneth Haar and so on, the older generation cared about the seaworthiness of their theoretical vessel. This lot now don't give a shit. And it is very discouraging. Um, on the other hand, I have to tell you that the same thing applies to Marxist economists who will pursue their mathematical economics models and errors with the same zeal and lack of intellectual curiosity. Economics is bad for your mental health and for your intellect, whether you're on the left or on the right. My second great error, which happened almost immediately as soon as I arrived in Britain in October of 1978. Remember the dates. April 79, Mrs. Thatcher comes in. I remember, I was politically active from the day one when I arrived in England. I remember 
having vociferous arguments with my English left-wing student mates, and I was arguing that it would be good for Thatcher to get in. That what the working class and the middle class in Britain needed was a short, sharp shock. I had assumed it would have been a short shock. That it would be sharp, I had, I had not, um, I had no doubt about. But my very naive, childish view was that things had to get bad before they get better. You see, I had read Lenin. Year after year, after Thatcher got in, things got increasingly worse and worse and worse. Every year, we used to think that things have gone so bad, they can't go get worse than this. And they did, inexorably. That was a great lesson for me. Instead of radicalizing the left, instead of radicalizing progressives in British society, what this tailspin of the British social economy did between 1979 and 1985 was it destroyed any possibility of progressive change in Britain. And that is a lesson that I carry to this day, and it's one of the reasons for the kind of stance that I'm taking in the context of the Euro crisis today. And why, even though it hurts, I have to confess to what the blogger of that left-wing uh, site said about me, that I am not proposing, I'm not going out there arguing for replacing capitalism, but for saving it from itself. So let's come to the Euro crisis. I won't give you a lecture on the Euro crisis. I've done so many, and I'm sure you've heard so many in the past. Let's just assume that we are on the same page on what happened. Just very briefly, the Eurozone was not designed to sustain a major shock, like the great financial crisis, the crash of 2008. It was bound to start unraveling. It was only predicated upon a kind of global surplus recycling that uh, was uh, conducted and orchestrated by Wall Street and primarily the twin deficits of the United States of America. That's my thesis. Anyone who's interested in that, I'm pre pre presenting it tomorrow in a book launch at 6 o'clock. So I won't bother you with that. But what has happened in Europe is that the European leadership's reaction to this systemic implosion that began in 2008 and which were nowhere near the end of, as we speak, as I speak, the reaction, the institutional reaction of the Eurogroup, of the European Union Council, of the European Central Bank, now of the European Stability Mechanism, will go down in intellectual history as an example of orchestrated idiocy at its worst. There are not going to be any winners here. This is not a typical class struggle where the labor share of income goes down so that capital share goes up. Here we're going to have an, a postmodern 1930s where in the end everyone except the Nazis, the bigots and the misanthropic racists will be a loser. We are a continent divided by a common currency, almost a Marxist dialectical uh, celebration. Fiscal rectitude now in the Eurozone and in the European Union more generally is being bandied about like democracy was in Iraq after it was invaded. It is just a term which is being used in order to hide, to disguise a hapless establishment which has no clue of the crisis that has befallen it and which resorts to the only thing that it does know how to do, and that is to squeeze the labor share of income and attack the weak and the dispossessed in order to minimize, in their eyes, the costs of what I call bankruptocracy, which is the new regime we live in after 2008, ruled by bankrupted banks. Now, Brecht in the Three Penny Opera said that, uh, wrote, brute force is out of date. Why send out murderers when we can employ bailiffs? I'm going to add to that by saying, well, why send out a Wehrmacht if you can have monthly Troika visits in Athens, in Dublin, Portugal? Soon, 
in a city near you. Always aware of our collective guilt as left-wing leaders over the industrial feudalism that in the end became of the Soviet Union, I shall nevertheless make uh, a connection between the European Union and the Soviet Union. They're very similar in the sense that they're both disintegrating with a few decades apart, and yet you've got a completely uniform party line running from Brussels to Frankfurt all the way down to the last capital of Europe, whether it's Malta or Nicosia. It's like an extreme Christian sect where, you know, it acknowledges facts only if they are congruent with the established official prophecies. Mr. Oliver, and I mentioned that in a discussion a couple of days ago, came out officially in a press conference and admonished the International Monetary Fund, not Syriza, the IMF, for having done what? The IMF came out and did a mea culpa, admitted to having erred in computing, in estimating, in prognosticating the effects of austerity on uh, growth. And Oli Ren, this unelected bigot, had the audacity to turn around and accuse the IMF of making his comments which, are, which were unhelpful because they stirred concern and doubt in the mind of the European people about the course that the European Union was following. I don't think even Brezhnev would have said that. So, personally, I am determined not to commit the same error I committed in the fall of 1978 and the spring of 1979. I am not going to say that, well, let European capitalism crash and burn. It deserves it. Let's build a better radical alternative on its ashes. I don't believe the left is ready. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but I know I'm not. So this is why, together with Stuart Holland and Jamie Galbraith, we're pushing for what we call a modest proposal for resolving the euro crisis. Because I believe that those of us who hate the euro, and I am one of them, I campaigned against the euro in the 1990s, have a moral almost authority, authority, a moral obligation to try to save it. Because its destruction is going to push us into a 1930s, which is maybe even a worse tragedy, tragedy, not just not be a farce, but be a worse tragedy. Or not only because, not, I'm not, I don't want to prognosticate a war, but what I'm saying is because there won't be a world war, that Great Depression could last 50 years, because there would be nothing to stop it. So let me end by saying that when I go around and I talk to hedge funds, to parliaments, to universities to school children in that attempt to forge strategic alliances, I often come up with statements that are quite appealing to very right-wing people. So, for instance, when in January 2010, um, I outlined, it was on the BBC World Service, a program for a Greek default within the Eurozone. Suddenly, I had calls from Ron Paul's strategists in the United States, from Tory MPs in Britain, from right-wingers all over the place, and Bloomberg, who were very interested because they thought that this is a very sensible policy. So what do you say to them? I hate you. I'm not going to go to bed with you. No. You try to create alliances that will minimize human suffering. A Greek default in, the, in January, February, April in 2010 would have severely reduced the poverty that we are now having on the streets of Athens, of Patra, or of Heraklion. However, this is my final confession, and it's the, mo the most serious one. The lure of power must never be underestimated. Anybody who's watched Mephisto, I want to make this parallelism. Taken seriously by the high and mighty, by hedge funds, by the Fed, 
it crept up on me, that sense of satisfaction, which is a very conservative, very non-radical, and very corruptive sense. My personal nadir came at an airport. It was last April, I was invited to give a talk in Berlin by a very rich outfit that was creating a conference in Berlin uh, with the head of ACB, Asmussen, and so on. And I was invited to go there, and at the time I was in the United States, so they purchased, was it a business class ticket, first class ticket for me. And I can tell you, this is a genuine confession, on the way back, after I had already had two or three legs of flying first class, there was a moment when my heart did not manage to remind my brain of what I always knew, that nothing succeeds in reproducing itself as a sense of privilege founded on a false sense of entitlement. I can tell you that there was that moment which was very critical to me, when uh, there was a huge queue of people waiting to go through the checkpoint, the x-ray machine at the airport. And I was ushered in very quickly because I had a first class ticket. And deep down, I suddenly realized I felt that I deserved that, which of course I didn't. And I've, you know, who else could I confess this to but you folks? I couldn't do this in Berlin. They would have laughed at me. So, just to quote Prospero, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. And this kind of radical confession is indeed, I believe, programmatically impossible. If you agree with me that we have to forge alliance, alliances with very unlikely forces and institutions, like, for instance, the IMF. Many Greeks, especially leftists, found it very strange to hear me a few months ago declare that a future Syriza government should try to forge an alliance with the IMF against the ECB but I believe it should. The problem is that the moment you go into bed with bastards like the IMF, your soul can be very easily corrupted and you can find yourself in the position of socialists of yesteryear who instead of changing the world, will manage to change themselves. So this is why I believe that radical confessions as a means never to lose sight of the misanthropy which is part and parcel of capitalism and its institutions is essential in the context of forging these alliances, the purpose of which is to minimize human suffering, at least in the short term. Thank you. Thanks, Yanis. Now, uh, I have one question. It's. Uh, it's a bit broad, but uh, given you're in a confessional mode, I've got to confess that I've got no great belief in such analytical mode as confessional mode. So I'm, I'm kind of prone to distrust you. Uh, uh, it's, it's always, when I, whenever I see the confession, it's okay, what are you trying to hide when you're confessing all this, you know, tr throwing the, the stars, but the, uh, uh, it's, a convincing, it's a convincing story. So that's one question. If you want to tell us, what, what, what did you didn't confess that you would like to tell us for, you know, what, what was the mode of confession hiding? That's one question. And it's the first idea I had when I read your abstract. I said, okay, what is he hiding? So I have got to this. And, and then on, upon hearing you and reading, and you've, uh, you've uh, addressed already some of the things we have discussed earlier, but... ...not be captured in economic equation, in mathematical equations, yes, labor input, correctly, fine, we agree. Uh, however, it is the basis of all wealth creation, labor, fine, fine. Third, third point, uh, and we can't have theory of value and growth, uh, they can't be given together uh, for all those reasons, so. No mathematical theory. Mathematical theory, There's yes. a difference, right? Yes. I didn't say you difference. can't have a theory of value yes. and growth, you can't have a mathematical model which is closed, neat, yes. and solvable. Yes. So, given all that, uh, in a political sense, what is the purpose of economics? Uh, what is the point of trying to use such an analytical mode of, of thinking, uh, such, such abstraction of, of, of life around us? Uh, what are its uses? Where, are, where do you see 
its boundaries, given especially that you've seen, you know, you've been inspired by Marx, like many of us here have been, but you have this benefit of seeing the other side because you've studied mathematics and you, you know, you've seen the enemy inside out and you've taken the enemy apart to bits in the modern political economics with your colleagues. So given you've seen both sides, politically speaking, why economics and, and may, maybe perhaps to throw in Simon Kuznets, because one thing you haven't addressed in your book extensively is, is national accounting. And I wonder, you know, he said there is no, we can't speak of economic modeling without knowing what's the purpose of economic activity. Uh, so, so that's the question. Okay, regarding the first point, what is it that I have not spilled out? I shall need a good psychoanalyst for this because I really tried to spill out what I, what I could. So I need to be either hypnotized or put on the couch in front of everyone in order to come up with something else. I can tell you lots of horrible stories about my private life, but I don't think anybody will be interested in that. Uh, from my, an intellectual point of view, I think that I've spilled the beans to the extent that I can. The second question, what is the purpose of economics in a radical intellectual agenda? Well, I'll give you two answers. The first one is by John Robinson, the, for, you know, the, the great uh, economics professor from Cambridge and student of Keynes. When students used to ask her, after hearing very similar critiques of economics to the ones that I put forward, so, professor, why should we bother with economics? If you're saying that it's such rubbish, why should we bother with it? And the answer was, a kind of Voltairean answer, so that economists can't fool you. Because, let's face it, if you, if you, if you go to any library at an, any university and you pick out a copy of the American Economic Review, any copy of the American Economic Review, and you don't understand economics and you don't understand mathematics, you will not be able to understand a single sentence. When you don't understand, it's very easy to be convinced that you don't understand because you are inadequate. And it's impossible to engage with people who, have, who claim to have proven theorems which prove that privatization is welfare enhancing. So we need to study the Bible in order to attack the theists. And if this is the Bible at the moment, it needs to be studied. The tragedy is that unlike the Bible, which you can read in a few months, and if you're clever enough, you, you, know, you can... I find it very hard when an 18-year-old student comes to me and says, you know, yeah, should I study economics? You know, I'm a, a radical, a political activist. I just don't think that I have the moral authority to say to her or to him, do it. Because it's a very arid existence. You have to go for years. It's, it's like being, you know, being recruited for the intelligence services. You have to go behind enemy lines. You have to dissemble. For years you have to, be, to pretend to be interested in something that you're not really interested in, that you're simply trying to subvert. You have to be immersed in a foreign language. You have to hide your own predispositions if you're going to get a good master's position, you know, be admitted at PhD level and get a lectureship. Um, I didn't so much hide it, but I was economical with the truth. In interviews, I would never claim to be a Marxist. If somebody asked me, I would say it, but nobody even imagined of asking me whether I was a Marxist. So it's a life of loneliness, but it is important. It's just that, you know, once upon a time, in the economics departments where I was, there was always some eccentric, not always left-winger, sometimes left-winger, sometimes eccentric in a humanist manner, that was an oasis for students of economics and allowed them a human contact with a member of faculty that was important. Thatcherism, the research assessment exercises in Britain, the metrics which ensure that only those who publish in the journals that have the maximum number of brownie points in economic departments have eradicated all eccentrics. So suddenly, you know, if you choose to do, I wouldn't do it today what I did back in the 70s, because they would be, firstly, back then we, I was imagining that neoliberalism was a passing phase and very soon you know, we would storm the, the citadels of academic economics again. It's not happening. Uh, all intellectual life is dying. Marxist economists have something to do with that because of the scholasticism that I mentioned. And 
why, why not just read some good books instead of getting immersed in these equations so that the bastards don't confuse you? But is, is that, is that uh, the way I'm hearing you, is that not just a critique of extreme use of mathematics rather than the economics per se? Because if you had a, a critique of economics per se, then why would you argue for and against of Eurozone? Surely you're, you know, you're basing your arguments that you're making publicly so widely and so passionately based on certain insights that you gain by learning how economics, uh, uh, how, how it operates. I mean, economic systems, how do, how do they operate? Well, let me tell you this, and I'll, no, no, that's another confession. None of my interventions in the political and economic arena of the last few years have been informed by economic models. They are well and truly irrelevant to really existing capitalism. What allows me, however, to be heard and to be invited by central banks and so on is the fact that I have this label professor of economics, which one can only get if one loses half his life or her life being immersed in inane mathematical models. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not a critique of mathematics. This is a critique of economics. It's not the, the tool's fault if it is being misappropriated and, and abused. Mathematics is one of the highest forms of hum human intellectual activity. And it is one of the few weapons humanity has had in order to conquer the threats around it. And it will remain a great source of inspiration to all of us. It's very good too, because it, it sort of sharpens our minds. But the moment you try to seek the truth about politi the political economy we live in, inside a mathematical model, constitutionally, you secure, you secure, you ensure, you guarantee that you will never be able to recognize really existing capitalism, even if it were to hit you with a stick over the head. So before we open, can we conclude, and let me open the floor, can we conclude that you know, the truth of your critique is that it, it's, it, the class struggle is the moment where you know, the value is being uh, split, where, you know, where the wealth is being distributed. That is, that is the indeterminacy that we can't capture. We can't say in, in advance what, what the split will be between the labor and the capital. Not just class structure, struggle. Yeah. I mean, class struggle, of course, is yeah. the, um, the, the, the foundation yeah. of the labor contract, but it's not just the labor contract. Mm -hmm. You can have all sorts of social phenomena that are happening within... Look, one of the beauties in Marxist analysis that even Schumpeter appropriated many, many years later is that, you know, think about it. For a thousand years now, the market has been spreading its tentacles into every activity, even inside our DNA. Soon, if they can sell the moon, they will, right? Uh, and privatize it. Women's wombs have been commodified. Uh, DNA has been commodified. And yet, there is a very interesting market-free zone. It is the company, the enterprise, the firm, once you sign the labor contract, that was Marx's great insight, you enter into a social relation of production. Suddenly, you may actually love your, your employer and your productivity may, may, may be huge. So it's not just class struggle, it's social relations of production which are irreducible to commodity exchange. Thanks a lot. Let's open the floor. Mate here, third floor, third row. Hi, so you mentioned series are just in passing, so my question is very concrete, as everybody, in you, especially in, in the European left, is very hopeful of Syriza, whether it is founded or of unfounded. What is your, what do you think, if Syriza wins the next election in, in Greece, is it realistic to expect if they, if they succeed in maintaining some sort of uh, left, leftist program, is it realistic to uh, expect them to do something concrete, and can that be some kind of uh, at least inspiration for the left in Europe, in other countries, to do something? In short, yes. In a slightly longer version, what is of the essence now in Greece, but also in other countries, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, is stabilization. The social economy now is spinning out of control downwards. You have a complete breakdown in the circuits of credit, Small businesses, large businesses, no businesses can borrow money. So even the ones who are potentially profitable are closing down. 
The public sector is in complete disarray. The private sector is uh, deleveraging. The combination of public expenditure and private expenditure is GDP, national income, and therefore it is crashing. And together with this imploding economic activity, both public and private, what you have is a society which is completely ill at ease with itself, giving uh, the oxygen uh, that is necessary to the serpent's egg to hatch, golden dawn. So Syriza's number one priority is to establish a 100-day program, let's say, during which 100 days it will have to do two things. Firstly, attend to the humanitarian needs of the dispossessed and save them from the claws of Golden Dawn who are going around the neighborhoods distributing food on condition that you have to prove your racial purity. Secondly, and simultaneously, Syriza must establish a negotiating position with the Troika. Establish a plan B and a fallback position, plus one or two or three very precise demands that it won't be willing to budge from once they are rejected by Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Draghi. Now, this is not an easy task. But is it impossible? No. And if it succeeds, this will be a major inspiration, not just for the rest of Europe, but for the world. Further questions, comments, provocations? Because otherwise, we'll go into psychoanalytical mode, which, trust me, you don't want to hear. Okay, there's a question over there, and then one there. Um, for your uh, political strategy, so to go in the bat, in, uh, in the bat with the enemy and that, for that help other human beings, uh, are you really convinced that by that you're not uh, doing really bad political strategy in that way that you're reinforcing this, I don't know, uh, bad forces of capitalism or society? Uh, for example, in history, you have uh, numerous examples where uh, some left or progressive political forces went into an alliances with right or bad political forces, to call it, and they lost because they thought they, they could control. For example, uh, in history, they thought they could control Nazis or nationalists, and they went to alliances with them, but then in the end, they lost. So do you think that these political strategies... It, it, isn't it going in the same direction? Do you really think that you can control, uh, I don't know, these hedge funds or IMF or, or uh, institutions like that by trying to change them from within? There are no certainties and there are no easy solutions. Indeed, there may be no solutions, but in this very dire moment of, in history, we have to, each one of us has to imagine to try to conjure up what we think is the strategy that has the best chances of mi minimizing human suffering. I insist on that. So take Greece, Spain, Portugal. We are in a common currency which is asphyxiating our social economies. Okay? So let's say that Syriza gets elected tomorrow, you get elected in one of the Eurozone peripheral uh, member states. What do you do? Do you get out of the Eurozone? Do you say, I'm not going to have negotiations with the powers that be? I'm going to simply erect barriers at the borders, create my own currency, see it diminish in value by 95%, and try to go for autarky? It, there is a case for this. There is a case for this. Uh, Argentina more or less did that. And I support what they did entirely. But Argentina had two major uh, advantages that Greece and Portugal and Ireland don't have. The first one was that it had its own currency. The peso existed. It was only a matter of 
cutting the peg with the US dollar and then defaulting and allowing the peso to fall. The second thing it had was huge tracts of land producing the goods that China wanted to buy precisely at that moment. Greece doesn't have either of these. We don't have the drachma to devalue. We have to create a currency. It will take, my, in my estimation, at least eight months to create it. So it's like, this is a, a bit like announcing eight months in advance devaluation. Do you know what this means? There will be nothing left eight months from now after the new currency is created. So if I'm right in that, and not everybody agrees with me <laughs> on the left, um, if, but if I'm right in that, the only alternative is negotiations. So who do you negotiate with? The equivalent of the Wehrmacht today is the Troika, as I said before. The Troika is the European Central Bank. It is Germany. It's called the European Commission, but really it's the Germany behind it. Right? And it's the IMF. Now, the ECB refuses to speak on any of these matters. It simply does as it's told by the European Commission and primarily its governing council where there is a terrible, terrible, terrible mix of board members, primarily Mr. Asmussen, right? And Mr. Weidmann, who is, you know, the good cop and the bad cop. So you can't talk to the ECB, and you have to negotiate with Germany through the European Commission. The IMF, perhaps the most misanthropic organization of the last 30 years, who are responsible for so much human suffering in Africa, in Asia, everywhere, for the last few years, they've been changing their tune and they've been breaking their alliance with Germany. I know that people in the IMF are livid with the German position on Greece, on Portugal, and so on and so forth. I see no alternative than to try to form um, an opportunistic short-term alliance so that in the first hundred days of a Syriza government, we can be given some breathing space during which to consider our options. Can we be usurped by the IMF? Are they reliable allies? We can be usurped, and they are not reliable allies. But this is the, the hand that we have been dealt. Um, hello. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you said, uh, I don't, uh, I can't uh, cite you uh, exactly, but the, the so, so, uh, social economic system is pregnant with its opposite. But uh, what if I tell you there is a country with 45% unemployment, which almost do doesn't produce any value? Now you're talking about stabilization uh, of, uh, of the Greece so that it doesn't get uh, more down. What about growth? What about growth after? Would, uh, would we still go? as a le left with uh, interventionistic and protectionistic measures, uh, building our industrialization through new, uh, building of a new bourgeoisie, uh, so to say, uh, or, or what to do? What to do, how to build the opposite, how to get pregnant uh, again? Because I'm talking about um, about uh, Yugoslavia, but uh, in the industrialization, concretely Bosnia and Herzegovina has 45% of unemployment. Uh, industry, the industry was sold to uh, scrap metal. What to do now? And the second question is: uh, Oliver Stone uh, asked uh, in the opening ceremony, uh, "Who would, who would you?" Uh, he uh, asked the, uh, uh, the audience, who would you want to act, uh, to play uh, Lenin, when you could uh, choose an actor? Uh, would you agree if I say I, uh, Patrick Stewart? Thank you. Let me start from the end. I, I have to confess, I don't know who Patrick Stewart is. Oh, I, Patrick Stewart, that Patrick Stewart. No, I prefer him as captain of the enterprise. <laughs> Regarding the first question, look, our small and almost destroyed countries, whether it's Bosnia or Greece or Portugal, in this era of injured globalization, 
injured after 2008, have no capacity to industrialize on the basis of autarkic economic policies, North Korean style. Once upon a time, it was mildly possible in the era of Bretton Woods and in the era when there were counterbalancing forces, including the Soviet Union, in the world economy. Let me tell you why I said before, and I think that connects to your question, that those of us who loathe the euro the most have the greatest moral imperative to try to save it. Imagine that we go this way. Imagine that the Greek government gets out of the euro tomorrow, regardless of what the cost to the Greek social economy is. Let's say that we agree that that's something we should do, that that's the least of our bad options, the better of our bad options. Do you know what's going to happen next? Portugal will be out immediately because Portugal is in exactly the same thing, situation. There will be a flight of capital from Portugal that will lead to, a, to the imposition of capital controls as in Cyprus. And the moment that happens, Italy is on the, on the verge. And when Italy goes, then France goes. And then before any of this happens, of course, Germany will be the one that leaves the Europe. They will reconstitute the Deutschmark, which is, in my estimation, exactly what the Bundesbank is, is campaigning for. And they will create a new euro, east of the Rhine and north of the Alps, including Holland, Poland, Austria, Finland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia. And the rest of Europe is going to be a patchwork of monetary unions or independent currencies, hit by simulta simultaneously by inflation and high unemployment, stagflation, whereas the Deutschmark Lebensraum, wider space, is going to be hit by the revaluation of the Deutschmark, or whatever they call that, Northern Europe. Massive shutdowns in industry. The German poor are going to be converted into, the, the, the German working poor are going to become German unemployed poor. The total macroeconomic effect on the planet of these developments is going to be detrimental to the prospects of Brazil, Argentina, including, and China. Japan is already moribund. So we are going to be creating the circumstances for a new Great Depression galore to the nth. Is this the environment in, in which we are going to try to create a new bourgeoisie within our small Balkan states and hope for industrialization? I don't think so. Right, so who's left not depressed? Enough? Okay. The left, the left is not depressed enough. Let's ask there. I would like to, I would like to come back to uh, what Jan said regarding the uh, alliance between Syriza and the IMF. Um, can you be more, more, more specific on this kind of alliance? On what grounds will it be based? And isn't it the IMF adjustment programs throughout the world which promote uh, privatizations, uh, uh, low uh, levels uh, of employment, dismissals, uh, and uh, low wages? It certainly is not going to be an alliance based on Marxist-Leninist principles. <laughs> of course not. The IMF is... Look, the IMF, of the two pillars of the Troika, the IMF is less keen on austerity, it is still keen on austerity for the reasons that you suggested, than Germany is. They explicitly say that austerity has gone too far that reductions in pensions should stop. The IMF has actually said that. It should not have gone that far, and it should, if anything, be reversed. And I'll explain why I think that is happening. It's not that they are going to be, become Keynesian suddenly, and that will approve of a series of program for borrowing from the IMF, let's say, in order to infuse funds into the health service or the pension system. That's not going to happen. 
where I think there is clear ground for an alliance, an alliance, an agreement, a short-term agreement, opportunistic agreement, concerns the banks. At the moment, as you know, the Greek tax bankrupt taxpayer is borrowing 50 billion euros from the European taxpayer to give to the bankrupt banks. When that money is simply going to go into a black hole and disappear, it will simply be used for the, by the bankers in order to retain control of their banks, the, the media, and their stranglehold over you know, Greek society. As somebody said about Goldman Sachs, they are like a giant squid on the face of society. And that is being funded by the Greek taxpayer and the European taxpayer who is lending to the bankrupt Greek taxpayer to do that. That we should stop. And the IMF would be with us on that. Because the IMF is completely and utterly against the way that the banks are being recapitalized. So when somebody says to them, and I know this from personal experience, why don't you we just give them those bloody banks away? If Deutsche Bank wants to come and get Alpha Bank, take it. We can use our own resources in Greece, um, resources that have not been privatized yet, in order to create a new investment bank, a new ETVA, for instance, in order to promote growth internally instead of privatizing. But the banks that we have should either consolidate or close down or be given to foreigners who won't take it, if we want to stay in the Eurozone. We can't stay in the Eurozone and have a national banking system when the bankers are bankrupt and the state is bankrupt. That is something that the IMF would agree with. And they would be able to utilize it as a bulwark against the way that the Germans and the French are clinging on to this cozy and corrupt relationship between politicians, polit local political elites in France and Germany, and local bankers, BNP Paribas, Deutsche Bank. I think that is very important. This is, this is something that Syriza should utilize. Uh, and I've been saying this now for some time. It's not going to be an alliance that will last, and it's not going to be pleasant, and it's not going to solve our problems. But if we can get the bankers off the face of Greek society, it's something. Question there. Uh, thank you. I have a comment slash question. Uh, first of all, thank you for your wonderful speech. Um, nevertheless, I think that you're speaking too much from a position of power, as if the left is governing the European Union. I completely understand that uh, we should do a compromise with the uh, rightist economic discourse of accepting the liberal economic policies, uh, and on the other side, trying to push our um, political stance of democratization, the economic policies, etc., etc. Uh, however, um, I think that you should um, you should understand actually that the position of the right is uh, the problem that they're not accepting our compromise uh, in the sense that we should uh, push the Uni European Union to a, a more political uh, democratic development so we can um, so we can see the the compromise that you are that you are projecting um, that's also my question how do you how do you think uh, that our strategy should be in order to um, convince the rightist economics to accept our compromise? Well, for a start, I don't see why you're saying, per permit me to challenge you on this, that I'm taking for granted that the left is in power. I think you for granted that the left is nowhere near power. Uh, but in places like Greece, in which Syriza has a realistic chance of being in power in the foreseeable future, this is the context in which I've been talking about what a Syriza government should be doing. Uh, on the broader question of how do, you ref how do you change the European Union, the European Union is um, a construct that is predicated on a number of myths, but the reality is not at all mythical or pleasant or pretty. It was never meant to be democratic. It was never a bulwark against fascism. It was never really a European project. It was always an American project. From day one, the Europeans, we love to think of, of the European Union as something that we have created. We didn't create it. It was the Americans that designed it, conceptualized it, and banged heads together until the French and the Germans got together in the early 50s to do it. And now that American hegemony has died, the European Union is fragmenting. And 
when a, an, an undemocratic beast is fragmenting, the result is not moved towards democracy, is moved towards autocracy. And nothing good is going to happen, to, 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 to emerge from this, until, until and unless the left gains 30 or 40% of the vote in each country. Is this going to happen tomorrow? Well, I don't know, but you know, if two years ago you had said to me that Syriza would be having 30% of the vote, I would have laughed in your face. Okay. Here, first floor, and then we'll get some in the back, but let's get one here. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I mentioned Hegel's thought that from history, people never thought anything. I, I come back to this uh, discussion, uh, not only uh, this evening. People think that they can return back in history. And all the discussions, not only here, all around the world, tend to uh, think how to go back in uh, history as things were before. But things changes not because we want, we cannot stop it. Uh, history goes on, uh, uh, doesn't matter if we please as we, we did or not. So the forces on the ground, on the historical ground nowadays, are mostly uh, connected with the financial system. Uh, nation states come from the 19th century. My question is, taken in consideration all the existing forces, whether uh, national states can exist in the next century as well. What do you think? Thank you. Please, let's have the mic in the back and let's get three more questions. All the hands that are up there, collect the questions and then Yanis can uh, answer because we only have 10 minutes to go. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, given the poor prospects of uh, industrialization under autarky conditions, that is protectionism, uh, protectionism in um, countries that are anyway depressed, um, as you mentioned before, uh, and given the, um, on the other hand, uh, poor prospects of growth uh, in uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, Greece, and uh, all the, the rest of the countries that are experiencing enormous problems. Uh, which relevance do you see for uh, commoning practices in these economies? Uh, because, uh, well, at least mainstream economies usually disregard the commons practices that uh, might uh, be extremely helpful. For example, in, uh, for example issuing complementary currencies, um, even at national levels, which was um, one of the uh, suggestions for, for Greece, for example. So which relevance do you see for these solutions? Hello. Uh, with respect to your thesis uh, about the Greek default in 2010 would be a better situation than what we have today, uh, can you briefly elaborate on that? Uh, because we still don't have a fiscal authority central. We didn't experience any inflation in the northern part of uh, monetary union. And on the other hand, uh, you already mentioned what would happen with the new drachma and the uh, value of it. So just if you could answer on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for very enlightening lecture. As I understand, main characteristic of capitalism is vitality of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship begins with self-employment in order to establish and maintain a fam uh, 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 family for self-reproduction. Why is the family declared the main enemy of Marxist ideology? Or why is the family subversive idea for subversive ideas we are considering? Right. <laughs> I'll start on the, the, the last one and then move forward. Um, 
Marx and Engels attacked the family not because they wanted to attack the idea of a couple getting together and pooling their resources, having children, being happy. He was attacking the property rights of employers over the male member of the family and the extraction of surplus value from him while he extracted surplus labor from his wife at home, therefore allowing the employer to have two people at, with one wage. It was, if you want, a critique simultaneously of the social contract and the sexual contract and the slavery of male workers and female attendants to the male workers. It was not an attack on the family. It was an attack on the institution of the family, especially as uh, articulated in the 19th century. Uh, moving on to the next point about, um, I can't even remember. The, 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 you mentioned the, the question about parallel currencies and to what extent could these be helpful in, uh, in the context of the crisis. Let me say this. While a parallel currency per se would be a complete and utter flop, there are ways of introducing quasi-currencies. So, let me put it this way. If Greece were to introduce a drachma in parallel to the euro, firstly, it doesn't have the right to do it according to treaties, but let's ignore that. Let's say that we break this treaty. Uh, Gresham's law tells us something very simple, that the bad money drives out the good. And it, it, it's a very simple idea. Why would you want to be paid in drachmas? if you knew that the drachma was created in order to be devalued. So effectively, unless the, the state imposes the new parallel currency as the currency in which taxes are paid, it simply won't catch on. It will simply flop. But there are ways of introducing, as I said, proxy uh, parallel currencies, and I've made such suggestions. One of the things that the state could do is it could issue tax credits, little pieces of paper, which uh, can be cashed in, let's say, next year. You buy one for a thousand euros or a hundred euros today, and can be cashed in next year with your tax return, and it extinguishes 120 euros of taxes that you're, you owe the state. And if these are made transferable and electronic and transferable over mobile phones, as in Kenya, you can have a very good euro parallel currency that is not controlled by the ECB. And that would give lots of degrees of freedom to a progressive government. Um, hmm? common. On? Common. Greece, common, practices. common practices. Civil society finds ways around problems. I remember back in, uh, in Australia in the 1991 recession, there was a village up on the Blue Mountains that developed its own currency. And it was based on IOUs between people. So I would paint your house and uh, I would get, you know, three credits for that and then you could use it, I could use it in order to to buy groceries from the local store. The local store would then pass it on to somebody else who would supply them with agriculture. And it actually worked very well. The problem with these practices, of course, is that they re rely on trust, and they're highly local localized, and they create a degree of parochialism, because these people who operate these uh, villages, they can neither accept newcomers, nor transfer, you know, go to the big cities to, or travel and use those those um, spontaneously emerged currencies. So they're an excellent device for short-term localized protection against the collapsing economic system, but they can't be the basis and the foundation. Now, let's not be pessimistic, however, about what can be done within the Eurozone. In, in the Eurozone, for instance, as I said before, we have gigantic quantities of unused money. Corporations in Europe have about three and a half trillion euros sitting there doing nothing. The ECB, the European Central Bank, is planning to introduce negative interest rates, negative interest rates, on banks that park money with the ECB. Why, do they, why, do, why would the bank park money with the ECB and not lend it? Because it is scared it won't get its money back. This is what the crisis does. There is money around to be invested, but it's not being invested because of fear. It is coordination failure. If everybody fears that the recession is going to be terrible, then the recession is terrible. This is a Keynesian point about animal spirits. So 
There is nothing to stop us without treaty changes, without federation, to have, for instance, the European Investment Bank, which is three times the size of the World Bank, embark upon a new deal, investment-led recovery program for Europe, up to 10% of GDP being invested in small enterprises, large enterprises, in collaboration with the ECB that should back 50% of these projects because the AIB issues its own bonds for the 50% anyway. So all that it takes to do this is the political will and the election of progressive governments that will go to the European Union and say, we are not leaving from here until we agree on that. You've got, you've got one minute on national state, if you wish. Oh, one yes. minute. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, of course, we live in the era of finance. And finance is uh, the quicksilver quality that, as Marx and Engels said in the Communist Manifesto, have brought down, not just with commodities, but with finance mm -hmm. too, the Chinese walls and all those impediments to free intercourse around the globe. So, erecting barriers and uh, uh, mining the borders in order to go back to the nation state developmental uh, model mm -hmm. is neither feasible nor desirable. Marx would never have it, he was an internationalist. He was celebrating globalization, he was not celebrating capitalism. There's a big difference there. Uh, so, you're quite right. But, don't forget, finance has imploded. In 2008, that whole edifice of financialized products exploded. And now, it is the dispossessed who are paying for these losses, making sure that political power is exercised in order to minimize the losses of the bankers. Let's thank Yanis and the translators together.